In 2012, a game titled Spec Ops The Line was released to strong critical and public reception. It was a linear third-person shooter with a strong emphasis on narrative and featured multiple endings. When asked about the game's endings, Walt Williams, the lead writer, had this to say. There are four official endings and one unofficial ending, one in Conrad's penthouse, three in the epilogue, and one in real life for those players who decide they can't go on and put down the controller. This is about that last so-called ending and why it's almost never an effective storytelling device. So, before I go any further, I want to make it clear that I really enjoyed Spec Ops Line and felt it had a good story with uh, mostly clever commentary about the effects of war. And I felt it succeeded pretty well in criticisms of other games of its genre. Where I thought the game fell flat, however, was in its attempts to criticize the player for essentially playing the game. Probably the most famous and memorable scene from the game is the sequence in which Walker, the main character, and his team are forced to use white phosphorus on enemy soldiers, and attack a group of civilians in the process. The scene in which they realize what they've done is acted, shot, or rendered, and paced really well. And the visuals of the fallout are graphic, but without feeling corny like video game violence often can. It's handled very, very well. The problem isn't really anything to do with the scene itself, but the way it's set up. This. this might help. Fine, set it up. You're fucking kidding, right? That's white phosphorus. Yeah, I know what it is. You've seen what this shit does. You know we you can't might not use have a choice, Lugo. There's always a choice. Actually, there isn't. That's kind of the problem. You're pinned down my enemy soldiers in a completely hopeless situation and forced to use white phosphorus. No matter what else you try, you can't beat the soldiers any other way. This on its own is fair enough, it serves as a hopeless situation, teaching that sometimes there's really no way out without tainting your conscience, at least a little. But once you begin to fire the white phosphorus at the soldiers, you're also forced to use it on the civilians. Again, this wouldn't necessarily be a problem if it were treated as a linear story game about the character of Walker and the effects of war on his mind, but that's not really the case here. See, the game actually criticizes you, the player, for making these decisions, instead of simply criticizing Walker, the character. The quote from the writer makes that intent abundantly clear, but there's another thing within the game itself that seems to reinforce this idea of turning the game off being the good ending, and that's the loading screens. So the loading screens start off pretty normally. It's standard stuff about tips and how to get better at the game and some story details sometimes. It's not really any different than any other game, but eventually it starts to have messages like this or this. Now, these aren't messages for the character of Walker. They literally can't be. They exist outside the narrative of the game itself. These are messages and questions directed at the player. It's the equivalent of a DVD menu chastising you for watching a violent movie. They blame you for the actions that the writers have written and that the character has performed outside of your control. But there's a bigger problem beyond just misguided criticism. In using these screens to talk to the player directly, the game actually creates a bigger separation between the player and the character. This loading screen in particular highlights the attempt at player criticism. Again, loading screens exist outside the narrative, so this is clearly aimed at you for still playing the game. But by putting the blame on you in this meta way, the game has separated you from the character. Blaming the player for Walker's actions but saying the right thing to do is turn off the game, which is purely a player choice, is a reduction of immersion. Now you could argue that the lack of choice exists to show how Walker feels in the situation, so it is immersion in a sort of twisted way. But putting the game away, which is supposedly the good ending, isn't a choice that Walker has an equivalent to. In that ending, you'd be entirely separating yourself from the character and making a choice that exists entirely outside the narrative, which isn't a real conclusion in a linear narrative story. Spec Ops, in my opinion, fails both at player guilt and justifying a player choice separate from a character choice as a proper ending. So let's talk about a game that handles player guilt a little bit better. Shadow of the Colossus. This game was released in 2005 for the PlayStation 2, though it's since been remastered for the PS3 and 4. I cannot recommend this game enough, it's one of my favorites in terms of story presentation. The basic idea of the story is that you're trying to revive someone dear to you and you have to kill 16 colossi in order to do it. 
I'm not going to go in depth on the story as a whole here, just the way the game handles player culpability. And to do that, I'd like to focus on the Colossus Valus. This Colossus is the first you fight, and it seems to perfectly set the stage for the rest of the game in terms of the way it treats the Colossi in the story. After an opening cutscene, then a small climbing section, you encounter Valus just walking and minding his own business. He towers over you like a monster, and you already know your objective is to kill him, so of course he's the bad guy here. You begin to climb his body, and triumphant music begins to play, reinforcing your heroic actions. You climb to his back, where the heartless mechanical stone that covers the lower body of Valus has been replaced with fur, just like any other animal. You climb higher, to the head, where the marking to deliver the killing blow lies. Here, the camera circles around you, bringing Valus's face to the forefront. The eyes aren't aggressive, like you would expect from a game monster, they're blank, like confused and curious. It's no longer a behemoth towering over you in the entire landscape, it's now in the forefront, and you're the nuisance climbing on top of it. The music still plays, reinforcing your actions. Then, you deliver the killing blow. This is where the victorious moment is supposed to happen, when the music is supposed to swell up into a wonderful finale congratulating you for your success in slaying the monster. Instead, this happens. And that's it. There's no loading screens criticizing you as a player. The game or the writer never attacks you directly. It simply makes the morality of the thing you're doing questionable to you. It puts the suffering of the Colossi clearly on display. The story of the game as a whole is also a little more vague and up for interpretation, so the idea of putting down the controller as an ending also works a little bit better, but only a little bit. It's still not a perfect solution. Turning the game off is still a decision made by you as a player outside of the game, and not as a character within this story. The more abstract and up to interpretation story blurs the line between player and character a little, as you can decide what wander the main character of the game is feeling to a certain degree since he's kind of a blank slate, but the line is still there. The game handles player guilt much better, but putting down the controller still isn't an effective ending within the narrative. So it's clear that player guilt can work, but can turning the game off ever work as a true ending? Well, yes. The best example I've found is a game called The Stanley Parable. This game came out in 2013 and is much more lighthearted compared to the other examples, at least on the surface. It takes meta-commentary to an extreme level and a decidedly different approach to convincing players to turn off the game. You play as an office worker named Stanley, and the game is essentially built around the idea of collecting different endings. Stanley is the main character of the game, and he has a backstory and therefore isn't just a pure player stand-in. But you'd be forgiven for thinking otherwise at first, seeing how bare bones his backstory seems. But we'll come back to Stanley's purpose as the main character and why this game doesn't use a name of Stanley. So you play as Stanley, walk around and interact with objects, some of which lead to a variety of endings. The thing that makes it interesting is the narrator. The narrator guides you through the story to one ending, what would logically be the true ending of the game since that's the one the actual narrator of the story is leading you towards. That's how stories work. But defying the narrator is where the central idea of the game lies. When he tells you to go left, you can go right. When he tells you to go through the red door, you can go through the blue one. When he tells you to go to a meeting room, you can jump out of a window. There are 19 endings in the game that I'm aware of, and only one of them actually involves following the narrator from beginning to end. Otherwise, he adapts to your choices and attempts to steer the narrative back to his story, or toys with you after you refuse to comply. The main idea of the game is, you fight with the narrator for control of the narrative. But the thing that makes the game work is that there is no control. Let's look at one specific ending. Right from the start when the narrator tells you to go to a meeting room, you can climb onto a desk, move to another desk, and jump out of a window. The environment outside is completely unrendered. You might think you've broken the game here. And then, the narrator dashes your hopes. At first, Stanley assumed he'd broken the map, until he heard this narration and realized it was part of the game's design all along. He then praised the game for its insightful and witty commentary into the nature of video game structure and its examination of structural narrative tropes. Here, you're still part of the game, his game. You're presented with a choice of yes or no, and if you choose no, he talks about the possibilities of what would have happened if you chose yes. And if you choose yes, he talks about how you could reset the game at any time. In this scenario, he's in complete control. This doesn't mean, however, that the narrator is always in control. In another ending, he abandons the game entirely. He wants to exist in this area for eternity. The only choice you have is to hurl yourself off a set of stairs while he protests. This is another way to do player guilt right, even though it's not exactly the same as Shadow of the Colossus. In that game, you were made guilty by being shown suffering of these animals, even though you as a person weren't directly responsible since you didn't have a choice. It was sad purely on a human level. In the Stanley Parable, if you feel guilty, it's because of choices you made. 
Whether or not you feel guilty will depend, I think, on if you get this ending early on. The more endings you get, though, the more you begin to realize that, again, there is no control. Every single ending gives you this same loading screen. There's no point in feeling guilty because none of your choices actually matter. Here's the last ending we'll look at before the comparison to Spec Ops and why I think this works and that game doesn't. You follow the narrator most of the way, but when you get to the mind control facility's entrance, you take the door to the left. Here, you get to tour around in a museum-like setting concerning the game itself, and a second narrator who seemingly narrates on one level higher than the narrator you're familiar with. This narrator implores you, the player, directly to stop playing the game. But listen to me. You can still save these two. You can stop the program before they both fail. Push escape and press quit. There's no other way to beat this game. Here's the brilliant thing about this ending. It's not hard to find. This was the second ending I personally got after the one following the narrator all the way through. If you also got it earlier, it might have seemed like a mostly facetious ending trying to mislead you, of which there are numerous in the game. But no matter what you do, you always loop right back to the beginning with a preceding loading screen saying the end is never the end. Eventually, either because they're bored, or have found all the endings, or because they've realized the point of the game, or rather the lack of it, every player will make the right choice here, and quit. So there's a few reasons that this works better than Spec Ops, in my opinion. First, there's the issue of immersion. Criticizing you for Walker's choices because you control him isn't automatically wrong. It's the fact that there is no real choice that's the problem, at least no real choice as a character. Any choice you make is as a player, meaning there's not really a reason to take Walker's decisions personally or blame yourself for them. This is also true of the Stanley Parable in a way. You, the player, are the ones that wrestle the control of Stanley away from the narrator and still make choices as the player. This is where Stanley's backstory and him having a name become important. The game uses it to make it clear that you are a person controlling someone else and the character isn't meant to be you. This deliberate separation of player and character means that every choice is a purely player choice, meaning you're directly responsible for what happens. The eternal loop of the game also helps, clearly illustrating that the only way for the game to end is when you quit, instead of it being an abandonment of the narrative. So in conclusion, Spec Ops illusion of choice combined with an attempt to guilt the player into doing something outside of its own story unintentionally splits player and character, actually giving you less reason to feel guilty than you would have had had the game just been a simple single player narrative. That's the path that Shadow of the Colossus takes, and it makes it much more effective in terms of player guilt. But it's the Stanley Parable that truly succeeds in making you turn off the game as a conclusion through its meta-commentary and looping, never-ending gameplay design. At its core, the reason that Stanley Parable works is that the villain isn't you, or the narrator, or this copy machine. The villain is the game itself. 